a lot of times CAD tutorials you watch are about one tool or one concept or one technique and they're done in isolation apart from how you might string them together on a real project and a lot of times the demo models that are used are so far removed from anything you'd actually want to execute in real life that it can be hard to know how to apply the thing that you just learned. So in this video I'm going to review a model that I made that was really project based and had an end goal of being made and I'm going to walk through the setup and why I set it up the way I did um, and then go through a bunch of tips and techniques along the way that you probably won't be able to learn anywhere else. So I uh, hope you'll stick with me. What I made was a paddleboard grip. So this was the old one and it was starting to crack and break. It's this chintzy blow molded thing. Um, it was coming apart at the seams and honestly it's like, like kind of ugly and all that. So uh, I thought being a designer and having access to 3D printers, like why spend another $30 on a new paddleboard handle when I can spend $30 worth of filament and several hours of my own time to make my own. <laughs> but uh, honestly I'm pretty happy with how it came out. Let me show you some pictures. So for the new grip that I made, I focused a lot on the ergonomics of the, the grip. Um, it has a nice big flat palm area on the back, and then when I wrap my fingers around, there's a little scoop in the shape and a nice grippy texture there that I can use to hold onto this thing confidently if it's wet. Um, I also focused more on just the general aesthetics, so I focused on having really clean curves for this thing and the nice flow, the texture fades out in a really subtle way that I'm happy with. Um, and on the back, there was a big flat area that needed something aesthetically, so I added mine and my wife's initials uh, because we're cute like that. So I printed this out of um, nylon that has chopped carbon fiber in it. Um, this was on the Mark Forged Onyx 1 printer, which we have here at Oval, and uh, I'm always pretty happy with the outputs. Uh, nylon's good, it's a high temp material, and then the carbon fiber adds even more rigidity to it. Um, and I uh, did a pretty dense infill on this, so I'm, I'm happy with how rigid it feels. And I also made sure that I oriented it so that the layers are in a favorable direction for the forces that this part is going to see when I'm actually using it. So I'm excited with how this came out, and I'm excited to walk you through how I made it. So here is the model of the paddleboard grip. Um, done in on shape as per usual um, and I again I've got all of my folders and I'm just gonna walk you through top to bottom how I got to this model so the first thing is making sure that the curves are good if you don't have good curves nothing you do after that will be good um, if you want to make clean surfaces you have to have clean curves uh, because you know you just can't get a better result than what your inputs are. You can only make it worse from there. So starting out, I used the uh, new Bezier curve or Bezier, I'm not sure, um, to create half of this and then mirrored it across. And again, I am always looking, if I'm doing fundamental curves here, I am always trying to check the curvature. Shift C will give us that. Um, so this one has a nice flow. There's no jars, no wobbling or anything like that. Um, in the future, if there's other ways to um, control the degree of this curve, then I might be able to not have it come down and then bounce back up. But for what I'm doing, that's fine. That just means it becomes flat right at the top. Uh, and so that'll work for me. And let's see, that's the, the front profile. Let's turn that off. Next, I made the bottom, this is just a circle. I think you know how that works. And then the side profile is where some other interesting stuff is happening. You'll notice that this is blue. And uh, I actually find that a lot of times it's okay, especially with like surfacing related stuff, to leave something blue as an indication that that's something that is actually meant to be edited and tweaked. So um, if you're working, uh, especially on a personal project, it especially doesn't matter. If you're part of a team, it can matter. Or if you're trying to make something that's like highly configurable, this can be a problem. But if it's a single thing that only has one configuration and all of that, it's not the worst thing in the world in my opinion. So let's look at the curvature here as well. Pretty darn good. So this is two separate curves, but they flow together just seamlessly. It looks like pretty great curvature. Um, so next thing, I wanted to make a guide curve in the middle. So let's see, that's gonna be this guy. And that'll help me to control. You can see it's a little bit bent because I wanted the thickest part from the side view to be a little lower than the thickest part from the front view. So to do that, I made a top uh, 
curve that is that, again, using that Bezier curve. And then I made just a giant arc that I knew would always be way beyond the, uh, the edges. Used projected curve to create this intermediate shape. So let's take a look at this curvature, not you. You. Also pretty good. I'm, I'm happy with that. I think if I crank this way up, I might start to see some funkiness. Uh, no wobbling, but you can see that the curvature comes back in, so it starts to flatten out around the edges and then gets sharper again. If I really wanted to futz with it, or if I was making this like out of chrome or something where the reflections really matter, I might try and get this cur curvature comb to just come straight across. But again, it's a 3D print, and I don't care. Good enough is good enough. So let's dig into this loft and how I made this uh, smooth shape with a single loft feature. I'll go in and actually just clear everything out so we can just walk through it again. I used these curves, that circle, that side profile, and our projected curve. Um, it's really important that all of these are touching the circle down here. Every single one of these is using a pierce constraint, and likewise this actually touches the curves at each of those points, um, which is due to how these are set up here. So just keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to pick this one first, that one, that one, and that one. Um, I am mindful of which one I choose first because at least within the UV structure of the resulting surface, that's the seam. Um, so I've got all those and I want to get this closed up. If you're used to another CAD system, you might be used to a closed loft button somewhere. Um, Onshape doesn't have that. Hopefully, maybe they'll add it, but um, in the meantime, you can get a closed loft by adding a closed guide curve. So if I drop in this circle, you'll see we get now a closed loft. The reason that I had added this uh, curve was because I didn't like how this was getting all pointy. So I probably started with just this and saw that it wasn't giving me what I wanted and that I needed more detail, and I went back and added these curves. In general, when you're making a surface, you want to use as few inputs as possible, so as few curves as possible, because your results are going to be smoother. It gives uh, your CAD system less to wrestle with, less to figure out. And if you over constrain it with like a loft with lots of profiles, for example, you can end up with a wobbly result. So uh, try to under constrain or um, just constrain minimally uh, all of your surfaces. So this, I would say, is about the minimum that I need to get the shape that I want. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm actually going to hit the X because just in case I did something slightly different, but I think that's the same. So that's what I wanted out of that. And uh, we, can, we can actually do something fun here. I'll show you what I mean about that seam. Um, if you just click on it and you hit Shift C, this is one way to see the structure of the surface. Um, you can drag these all the way down if all you want to see are the lines. Um, so you can see we're getting this kind of hot air balloon vibe, but you can see the structure of the lines across, they're, all, they're pretty close to parallel, good enough for me. I mean, it's not like you need them parallel anyway, it's just good to be mindful of what your structure is. And these are nice and evenly spaced, and uh, they're not twisting or anything like that. Another way you can see this is just right here in the loft feature, go show ISO curves, uh, and you get another preview of basically the same underlying structure. Uh, what one thing that you might want to see that you can't really see with either of those tools is where the beginning of this as a seam is. So there's a feature that I wrote called face curves, and uh, normally it creates actually selectable curves that just fall on those same uh, lines like you're used to um, from those other tools. But if you go here to parameters, add a curve, and then type in a, a zero or a one here, this is kind of like the location goes from 0 to 1, sort of like a percent. So if I do you know, 0 0.2, it's 0 0.2 of the way along. You can start to see how it's moving around, uh, moving around the shape here. So if I go 0, that's going to show me where the seam of this surface is. This is like the beginning and end of the surface as it wraps around. Um, so I put that off to the side because I know I've, I'm going to be embossing some stuff and I know I'm going to be cutting and doing some other surfacing on this front face, so I didn't want to have to like work around that seam, so I just got it out of my way. Um, so with the main shape in, now it's time to develop that scoop for the fingers. So here's how I did that. I made this shape, again, you're seeing some blue because I want to leave these things editable so that I can play with them. Um, if I was making a highly configured model, I'd probably find a way to lock it down, but I'm still, it's more, it keeps it more sculptable for me. 
So this is slightly offset from my uh, input curves here in sketch one. And then this is just more of those Bezier, Bezier curves. <laughs> you tell me your opinion on the pronunciation. Um, this is symmetrical. I could just use the split, split feature from here directly, but I would get it split on both sides of this surface, which I don't want. So I just made an extruded surface and split with that um, so that I end up with just this on the one side that I want that scoop. And you'll remember that that's uh, here. This is like the guide for that. Um, so I'm going to get rid of that face because we don't need it. And then I'm going to rebuild it with a loft. So I just converted out the circle from sketch two and trimmed it. So I just have an arc here. Um, you can make that arc however you want. For this one, I needed another profile. And let me just show you. I'll, I'll go into the loft. This is more like how I actually got here. Um, if I get rid of this curve, you can see how the structure here is really wavy. And because I know that later in the model, I'm going to be using the attractor pattern custom feature that I wrote to do that texture, that texture is going to follow this grid. So I need to control the grid now so I have a clean input that is actually structured the way that I want. So the way that I did that was to create, well, let me just roll before that. I created this curve. Um, it's just on a sketch plane that's up here, and it's an intersection curve with this so that I can reference it. And then um, I made used the freeform spline tool to create a curvature continuous spline that passed through there. And uh, you know I can, I can play with the placement of this if I want. But um, this one, I used that sketch curve there as the input so that I know that it's piercing right through there. Um, otherwise, this would fail because the guide curve wouldn't intersect my profile. So now that I've got all the curves I need to make the loft I want to fill this shape, let me show you how I'm going to go through that process. Loft feature, I'm in surface mode. The profiles are going to be this edge, this guide, uh, the center thing, and that edge. Um, you'll see that it turned red here because it's trying to add it, but it's only touching here at one point and uh, you know, it's causing problems. So you could go new and it'll start to work. Um, all right, so now we need to start shaping this thing. You can see it's kind of like pointy. It doesn't follow the arc, so we need some guides. One set of guides will be the arc. I'm going to turn on show ISO curve so I can watch the grid develop as I work. The next guide will be this and that, but if I pick them both in order, it's actually going to add them as two entries here. So I just get rid of that, and I can expand this and add it as sort of a group. Um, so now we go. We've got we've got our loft working, um, but there's still some work we need to do here. One, the grid is not working the way we want. We want it more straight across so that it's a regular grid for our retractor pattern later. And second, we're not getting continuity. I'm going to click Add at this point. We're not getting nice continuity um, here at the edges. Let me show you what I mean. If I hide all that and I turn on our curvature visualization, turn off Show Edges, you can see we've got a break here where the reflections are not true because there's nothing controlling that surface continuity. So inside the loft here, on the Start End Condition, I'm going to hit Curvature. And on the End End Condition, also Curvature. And now we're going to have this nice smooth edge. And then because this guide curve up here is hitting, uh, there's no continuity type, it's just positional, we're going to get a hard edge that fades out to curvature. So that's how you get that kind of fading bone line effect. So you can see we get a nice crisp edge that fades out to absolutely zero. It looks really smooth and nice. Um, And then the last thing that we need is to add that middle guide curve that's going to control the grid. So watch that update. There we go. Um, and it's worth noting that if you're going to have curvature you know, in conditions here, that your guide curves have to be curvature too. If you have like a positional guide curve, like it's just like hitting, like a, forming a crease, you can't have a smooth in condition. You're asking it to do an impossible thing. So again, your curve quality is uh, an absolute prerequisite for a quality surface. Uh, lastly, I just closed up this hole. Um, I used a, a custom feature that I wrote called cap. Um, all it's doing is finding any open edges and then trying to do a fill surface. 
which can be nice if you aren't always going to be sure which edges are going to be open or their IDs get broken or you just don't want to pick all of them. You know, if you had like uh, a polygon with an open face and it was like 100 sided, you don't want to have to click, click all those. And then if you change the number, you don't want it to fail. So this can be a little bit more stable, a little bit quicker. It's more of a convenience than a necessity. Um, you could just use fill or any other way of making that and filling it in. Okay, so now that I've got that capped, the next thing we're gonna do is build the shaft and all the stuff that we need to actually attach it to the existing handle. So here's where we're headed with that. Um, it's a shaft that comes out and it has these three holes that just make room for the pin so that when you adjust the thing all the way down, there's still room for the pin to go in and lock it in. And then this smaller hole is going to receive a screw that acts kind of as a linchpin to just hold the entire handle into the metal tube that attaches to the paddle. So uh, I'll just walk through a little bit really quickly here. This is pretty basic stuff. And then when it gets interesting, I'll slow down. But we've got circle sketch, extrude, and then a chamfer to make this easier to lead in. Next, I added this sketch nine. And it's a circle, but I'm actually not using the diameter of the circle. I'm just using the fact that it is a circle. Um, and that's because I'm going to be using it to make an implicit mate connector later. I'll show you what I mean. So using the center point of that circle, I created a hole for the screw I intend to use, which is an M4. Um, let's drop a section view so you can see what I'm working with here. Not that. 90 degrees, okay. Um, so that goes there. What I want to do is embed a nut inside the 3D print. So I'm, I'm gonna print up to a certain level, pause the print, put a nut in, and then keep printing so that the nut's like permanently part of this, uh, this thing, but it has nice metal threads so that I know it's not gonna strip out. So I gotta make room for that. And uh, to do that, I'm using move face to make the hole deeper. And then I'm using my custom feature called captive nut, and that's where I'm using the implicit mate connector. So that circle is what I'm picking to create a mate connector that's oriented correctly. If I just, uh, if I didn't do that and I just picked this point, it's gonna be facing the wrong direction. So by dropping that circle in there, it just gives me something to reference, and I've got my nut right there. Um, I'm not gonna give a tour of this because I do in other videos, but I'm using it with the embedded mode turned on, so that means that it's actually gonna create um, an extra little support body as well. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So I'm printing in this orientation. Um, and let me section it and just show you how the printing would work. And I'm thinking through this as I go. So as I print this part, it's gonna start there. There's gonna be supports where I need them. It's coming up, up, up. Here's my hole, there's my nut. Oh. Here's where the nut will be. And then I'm gonna print it right up, right before the layer bridges over the top, like that. And I'm gonna pop in a nut, and then I'm gonna pop in this little support piece. Um, let me hide the body so you can see that. This just hugs the nut and makes a nice flat top so that when it's printed over the top, the nut is really secure on the inside. And so this is generated automatically by the captive nut feature. All right, let's move on. Uh, next is just making these holes on the other side and because I want to print as much as I can without supports like I need supports under here for sure but I don't want to get supports all into this hole that I have to tear out and I really don't need them here for any reason um, it's just extra work for myself so using another custom feature that I made I'm it's called 3d printed hole it's going to take these holes and split them at an angle that's 45 degrees which is a really fine angle for an unsupported overhang if you're doing an FDM print. So inside that feature, um, I'm just picking this hole and these two holes, and uh, I've got select patterns on, so it'll automatically get these identical ones. And uh, yeah, it does all the work for you. So you, you could you know get in there and make a sketch of teardrop shape and extrude it and do all that, but um, I found myself doing this often enough. Uh, it seemed like a fun, achievable project, so I, I just coded it up instead. And then lastly, adding chamfers to all the holes because I want to make it easy again to lead things into the hole as needed. So that's that. Um, let's roll to here. All right, all I've done here is just modeled the actual metal tube just to gut check and make sure that it's looking right. Um, and I think it is. So the only thing that might be interesting to look at here is all basic, except for I'm using my custom linear pattern plus feature 
And the benefit of that is that I can I don't have to re-specify the space between the holes because it's already captured one of these. Yeah, right here, sketch 11. So I'm referencing this vertex and that vertex of sketch 11, and it's automatically measuring and specifying the spacing for my pattern. So if I change that sketch, it will change these holes and these holes. So that's pretty much all I'm doing here that's interesting. All right, let's move on and talk about how I made the grip texture on this paddleboard handle. So um, this is where we're headed with it, and I will talk through how I thought about it and set it up on the front end. It does take some thinking and setup, but you know you can't really beat these results any other way. So uh, let me just talk you through how I thought about it and got this thing set up. So what I want to do is texture this area right here, um, but I also wanted to pull the texture back away from those top edges a little bit so that none of the instances would overlap this edge. And I wanted to actually give a little bit of breathing room to that faded bone line that we worked so hard to get looking nice with our secondary loft. So I'm filling in this region with the top edge pulled back from uh, that crease. Then the next thing I'm thinking about is I want the, the pattern to fade gently from the bottom to the top. So in this diagram, think of black as really, really teeny tiny instances and white as big coarse instances. So uh, we'll have essentially a gradient from the bottom to the top. And then in addition to that, I also want to make sure that it fades out toward the edges of the pattern so that no part of the pattern feels abrupt or just ends. Um, it gives it a little bit more of a nuanced look. So in order to create the pattern that you're seeing now, here is how I went about it. First, you can just take this surface and offset it. I like to offset surfaces at a dimension of zero pretty frequently. Uh, it essentially just copies them. I think I do more, than, <laughs> more of that than actually offsetting. All right, with this surface offset, I can select it, um, use the transform command, with it set to rotate. I need an axis to rotate around, but instead of making anything new, I'm just gonna pick a point from one of my old sketches. I'm gonna hold shift so that it doesn't inference anything. Uh, if I don't hold shift, I get all these little highlights. So I'm gonna hold shift and then mouse over the point that I want and let go of shift. It's an easier way to make, uh, make connectors. Then um, you can see it's twisting it the wrong way. So I'm gonna go here, realign, and the primary axis is going to be the right plane, meaning that the blue axis, the axis that it's going to rotate around, the Z axis of our mate connector, is going to go in the same direction as the right plane. Next, I'm going to flip this and make it go upward. Um, and for reasons that I'll get into later, I'm going to pull it a little bit closer um, because it will impact how much fall off we get at the edges. So I think something like five degrees is looking pretty good. So now if I section through the right plane, hide that sketch, you can see what we're getting. This surface here is touching right down there and then it just gradually gets further and further away in a nice controlled way. So if this was all we were doing, we would end up with small instances down here and big ones up here all the way. Now we don't just want that, we also want it to fade out at the edges so all we have to do to make that happen is click these edges as attractors as well. So um, the way that the, the attractor pattern works is basically any point, it, it makes a bunch of points on the face and it measures how far away that point is from some attractor that we have picked. So it can be a face or a point or anything. Um, and then uses the difference in those dimensional values. So some of the Distances are going to be small, some will be bigger, and it uses those to drive other kinds of things about the instance, like how big it is, or how rotated it is, or what color it is, or you know how deep it's pushed into the part, things like that. Um, so if we have this surface selected, that means points in the middle are going to be referencing the surface because they're a lot closer to that than they are to the edges. But if I have a point that's way over here, really close to the edge, it's obviously going to be closer to this edge. And at some point, as you travel into the face, it will switch and start being closer to this. So that's what's gonna give us our fade. Um, and if I had made this transform come way higher, the point at which traveling along this face, you would become closer to this surface than that surface is further in. So by bringing this down, it controls at what point we get a fall off at the edges of our pattern, that secondary gradient that I talked about. 
So with our attractors set up, we need two more inputs for the um, attractor pattern feature. We need a base surface that we're going to pattern on, and we need an input body that we're going to pattern all over the place. So the input body that I use is this little guy. Um, you could make this however you want, um, sketching it out or anything like that. I used my custom feature that I'm kind of like testing out on some things right now um, called shapes. Um, and it works like this, so you can make polygons. Um, you can configure this, which is different than like a sketch polygon. That was part of my inspiration here. But I also added some additional shapes, like a star, so you can uh, make stuff like this pretty quickly, which again, it's more of a convenience than a necessity, but uh, I, I was trying it out. So here's my input body. And then, uh, so we have that. We just need a base surface. The way that I got the base surface was to thicken this surface. Now remember, um, I would just use this surface, but we wanted to pull the pattern back from this edge a little bit to give this edge some more visibility. So the way that I made a base surface for that was I thickened it like so, and then I used move face to pull that boundary back. OK, so now we have our base surface that we're going to pattern on. We have our input body that we're going to pattern uh, around the thing. And we have our set of attractors that we're going to use to pattern. So let's jump into setting up the attractor pattern. Um, I'm going to just use the option C thing to bring up the search and just type attractor. Um, I find myself using that more and more. So the base surface, remember, we don't want that. We actually made this body so that it's set back a little bit. So that's my base surface. That's what I want to pattern on. And then uh, for the input body, I'm going to pick same studio, and I'm going to pick that little guy that we made, the star. I don't need a make connector, because I already created my input body on the origin oriented how I want. So this is optional. And then for the attractors, um, we know we have this surface. that That's the one that we moved. And um, I also want to get the edges of my handle body. Let's see. And I'm going to throw this in there for good measure. So now you're seeing we're, we're, as soon as I picked an attractor, we're starting to get these shapes patterned on here. And so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to grab this, let's see, the input body. So I have all these things that are highlighted because I'm here in this query box, and I, those are kind of going to be obnoxious to me. So I'm going to pick something that's like either has nothing selected or something small selected. The input body is tiny. I'm just going to highlight that. It'll make it easier to see what's going on. Um, and from here, it's time to build my grid. So I'm going to collapse the pattern inputs and open the grid parameters. I'm also going to pause the regeneration so that we can just work with points. These are a lot faster to compute, and if we uh, left it off every time we change something, it would be really slow. So I'm going to crank this till it feels about right. Um, I know we also need a triangular grid because I'm using a triangular input and I want it on that kind of a grid. So what I'm doing is just essentially eyeballing it. Like I want some parts of the grid to look about like a regular hexagon. And I think right here in the middle, that's looking about right. So the next thing I want to try, I'm just going to take a stab at, is the instance parameters. Um, and I need to decide what the smallest shape I want is and what the biggest shape I want is. Uh, because I made the diameter of this one millimeter, then if I go into scale, a scale of one is one millimeter, and a scale of five is five millimeters. So the things that are farthest away from all of our attractors, I want to be bigger. We're going to go with five millimeters. And the ones that are really close, I want to go down to almost nothing. So we'll go 0.3. Um, and that's all I need. And then on the pattern parameter side, I typically will just turn on the fall off. I usually just pick wave and uh, you know 0.5 of a wave. You don't have to understand that one yet. If you go look at the other attractor pattern video, I'm sure I get into that. But um, what this does is helps have more of a gradual transition between them instead of kind of a linear calculation of the numbers. So this is now set up how I want it. Um, lastly, I am going to leave it on new and make a composite part. And what that will do is prevent me from having to actually combine every body uh, that this creates with the main part. 
because that's one of the most uh, com computationally intensive things you can do in Onshape or any CAD package is some kind of Boolean operation. So because I know my 3D printer doesn't care, and I don't care, I'm going to just make a composite part, and then when I export it, I'll just export one STL, and my slicer will still process it like one part. So I don't have to combine it here to do that, and it's going to cut down on the computational uh, weight of this feature a dramatic amount. I would say it, <laughs> in some cases, is the difference between usable and not usable. Uh, okay, so now that everything is set up the way that I want, I'm going to unpause and see if we're getting anything like what I was hoping for. It's still probably going to take about 13 seconds to calculate or so. Okay, so here's what we have. And that's pretty cool already, but I think I really want to crank the density. I want these things to start to intersect each other. I really want this line to be kind of pointing at the center of that point. So I'm going to pause it again and make the grid more dense. Okay, we're going to say that that's at least worth calculating to see how it looks. So I will unpause and we'll let this thing process. Again, it can get a little bit tedious because it's doing a lot. All right, let's look at what we have here. That's looking pretty good. Um, I'm liking, you know, the grid gets really dense at the edges, but because we're making these things so small, they're still working out. Um, I, I think that this is good enough for me to not take another run at the demo. I'm just gonna exit out of this because you get the idea and I'll unsuppress this one that, uh, you know, I sat and tweaked until I was happy with. All right, now that you know how I got here, take another look at this pattern. Uh, I just kind of eyeball it so that these look like they're flowing and uh, we get a nice fade toward the bottom, and we're fading out toward the, all of the edges and seams. Um, I like that we're keeping this edge visible. I just think aesthetically it's nice to have this kind of bone line that fades out. Um, and then what I do here with uh, the delete part three is just clean up all of this uh, stuff down here, all the surfaces and extra stuff that I used as construction geometry because I'm not going to need them anymore and they're just uh, sitting there cluttering things up. All right, last we have the, the text that I added uh, and there's maybe some stuff that's interesting here so I'll continue, uh, continue touring you through this. The way that I did the extrude, I just made sketch text. I extruded uh, the one direction, I went through all so it's just blasting all the way through and then for the second direction I chose the face of the loft and I flipped the direction of my arrow here. So they're both going the same way. And then I offset from the face of the loft. So it, it's uh, going almost up to that face and then stopping. So it's, uh, what we end up with from that is essentially this, uh, this offset surface inside the part, even though my sketch is right here on the front plane. So I, I like working that way when I can. You can flip the extrude second direction uh, to get it to do some other stuff. And then from there, I wanted to do some filleting. Um, I used my custom feature selection fillet uh, to choose all of the edges that are going in this direction, so the direction of the extrude, because I want those to be kind of bigger fillets. And if I change the letters, the way that I've got this set up, it'll still pick those up. Again, I'm not gonna give a detailed tour of this feature because I already have one elsewhere on the channel, but uh, I'll just walk you through. Well, let me just walk you through. So I'm going to roll before that feature and go through it again. Selection fill it. I'm going to add a selection. I'm going to select every edge on this body. So we're getting everything highlighted. And in here, there's a couple of ways you can select stuff. So I can turn off all the concave edges or all the convex edges, which can be handy sometimes. But what I want is all edges that are going in a direction. The direction is going to be my front plane. And uh, there's a tolerance put in here in case, you know, you're working with like something with a little bit of draft or something like that. You still want to pick up those edges. So that's great. I'm getting all the edges that I want here, but I'm also getting all these extra ones that I don't want. So I'm going to add an additional uh, criteria here. Um, I'm going to intersect this criteria with what I already have, meaning that um, it's going to only pick the edges that fit this criteria and this criteria. So I'm going to choose intersect and the parent feature will be that extrude. You can also pick it here. So now it's only getting edges that belong to the extrude and are going in that direction. And it doesn't matter what I extrude or if I change that sketch or anything like that, it's always gonna find edges that fit that criteria. 
So that's what I'm doing here with selection fillet. And one reason that's nice is because I can come in here with the parting line draft. I want to draft this with a pretty steep angle so that again, I don't need supports. When I'm printing this thing, this, all these faces are going to be angled at least 45 degrees away from the build plate. So uh, they're, they're not going to be any unsupported overhangs here. I also think that it actually makes a pretty cool aesthetic. So by creating all those fillets first, I only have to pick one edge per shape uh, in order to use the parting line propagation and get all of them. If I had done the draft first, I would have to go pick every single edge because they are all terminating at a sharp corner. So I did that and then selection fill it again to make sure that I'm picking all of the edges made by extrude 5. So again, it doesn't matter what letters I use. If I change them out, this should capture that. And the last thing I'm doing is adding this teeny tiny chamfer here, just so that I don't have um, a sharp edge. It's nice to give it a small edge break. Uh, you'd be surprised how much of a difference it can make. Um, and then again, more, more cleanup so that when I export this, I'm only getting the stuff that I want. Um, so all I have to do is export this whole thing. This surface probably should have been deleted somewhere up here as well. But yeah, I can export this whole thing and print it. All right, so that is how I modeled this paddleboard grip. Um, in the videos that I make here, I try to assume that I'm talking to like intermediate kind of users, which inevitably means I'm going to go too fast for some folks and uh, not everything's going to make sense. Uh, and that's okay with me, but feel free to reach out in the comments and let me know if you wanted any clarity on an area that did not make sense. Um, or if you learn something new that you can apply to your own work, let me know that. And of course, if you like me making these videos, uh, liking, subscribing, and hitting the bell, all are things that help me make it more worthwhile for me to do videos like this. Thanks for watching.